This is Things Fall Apart by Chinwa Achebe, Part 3, Chapter 23. For the first time in many years, Okonkwo had a feeling that akin to happiness. The times which had altered so unaccountably during his exile seemed to be coming round again. The clans which had turned false on him appeared to be making amends. He had spoken violently to his clansmen when they had met in the marketplace to decide on their action, and they had listened to him with respect. It was like the good old days again, when a warrior was a warrior, although they had not agreed to kill the missionary or drive away the Christians, they had agreed to do something substantial, and they had done it. Okonkwo was almost happy again. For two days, the destruction of the church, nothing happened. Every man in Amofia went around armed with a gun or a machete. They would not be caught unawares, like the men of Abame. Then the district commissioner returned from his tour. Mr. Smith went immediately to him, and they had a long discussion. The men in Amofia did not take any notice of this, and, they did, and if they did, they thought it was not important. The missionary often went to see his brother, his brother White Man. There was nothing strange in that. Three days later, the district commissioner sent his sweet-tongued messenger to the leaders of Amofia, asking them to meet him in the headquarters. That also was not strange. He oft often asked them to hold such palvers, as he called them. Okonkwo was among the six leaders he invited. Okonkwo warned the others to be fully armed. An Amofian man, Amofia man does not refuse a call, he said. He may, he may refuse to do what he is asked. He does not refuse to be asked, but the times have changed, and we must be fully prepared. And so the six men went to see the district commissioner, armed with their machetes. They did not carry guns, for that would be unseemly. They were led into the courthouse, where the district commissioner sat. He received them politely. They unslung their goatskin bags and their sheathed, and their sheathed machetes, put them on the floor, and sat down. I have asked you to come, began the commissioner. Because of what happened during my absence, I have been told a few things, but I cannot believe them until I have heard your own side. Let us talk about it like friends and find a way of ensuring that it does not happen again. Ogboyfi Ekwaimi rose to his feet and began to tell the story. Wait a minute, said the commissioner. I want to bring in my men so that they too can hear your grievances. Take warning. Many of them come from distant places, and although they speak your tongue, they are ignorant of your customs. James, go bring in the men. His interpreter left the courtroom and soon returned the twelve men. They sat together with the men of Amofia, and Obguifi Ikweme began to tell the story of how Enoch murdered an Iwojiwu. It happened so quickly that the six men did not see it coming. They were only a brief scuffle too brief even to allow the drawing of a sheathed machete. The six men were handcuffed and led into the guard room. We shall not do it you any harm, said the district commissioner to them, if you only agree to cooperate with us. We have brought a peaceful administration to you and your people so that you may be happy. If any man ill treats you, we shall come to your rescue. But we will not allow you to ill-treat others. We have a court of law where we judge cases and administer justice, just as it is done in my own country under a great queen. I have brought you here because you join together the molds to others to burn other to burn people's houses and put their place of worship. That must not happen in the dominion of our queen, the most powerful ruler in the world. I have decided that you will pay a fine of 200, 200 bags of cowries. You will be released as soon as you agree to this and undertake to collect that fine from you people from your people. What do you say to that? The six men remained sullen and silent, and the commissioner left them for a while. He told the court messengers when he left the guard room to treat the men with respect because they were leaders of Umofia. They said yes, sir, and saluted. As soon as the district commissioner left, the head messenger, who also who was also the prisoner's barber, took down his razor and shaved off all the hair of the men's heads. They were still handcuffed, and they sat and moped. Who is the chief among you? The court messengers asked in jest. 
We see that every helper wears the anklet of a title in Umofia. Does it cost as much as 10 calories? The six men ate nothing throughout the day and the, net, and the next. They were not even given any water to drink, and they could not go out to urinate or to go into the bush when they were pressed. At, the night, the, at night, the messengers came in to taunt them and to knock their shaven heads. Even when the men were left alone, they found no words to speak to, to any, another. It was only on the third day, when they could no longer bear the hunger and the insults, that they began to talk about giving in. We should have killed the white man if you had listened to me, Okonkwo snarled. We could have been in Umaru, Umaru now waiting to be hanged, someone said to him. Who wants to kill the white man, asked a messenger who had just rushed in. Nobody spoke. You are not satisfied with your crime, but you must kill the white man on top of it. He carried a strong stick, and he, and he hit a man few blows on the head and back. A conquo was choked with hate. As soon as the six men were locked up, the court messengers went into Amofia to tell the people that their, that their leaders would not be released unless they paid a fine of 250 bags of calories. Unless you pay the fine immediately, said the head man. We will take your leaders to Umaru before the big white man and hang them. This story spread quickly throughout the villages and was added to it as it went. Some said that the men had already been taken to Umaru and would be hanged on the following day. Some said their families would also be hanged. Others said that the soldiers were already on their way to shoot the people of Amofia as they had done in Abame. It was a time of the full moon, but that night the voice of children were not heard. The village Elo, where the always gathered for a moon play, was empty. The women of Ugwe, Iguedu did not meet in the secret enclosure to learn a new dance to display later to the village. Young men who were always abroad in the moonlight kept their huts kept their huts that night. Their manly voices were not heard on the village paths as they went to visit friends and lovers. Umofia was like a startled animal with ears erect sniffing the silent, ominous air and not knowing which way to run. The silence was broken by the village crier beating his sonorous ogene. He called every man in the mofia from the Agawala age group upwards to a meeting in the marketplace after the morning meal. He went from one end of the village to the other and walked all its breath. He did not empty out any of the main footpaths. Conquo's compound had like a deserted homestead. It was as if cold water had been poured onto it. His family was all there, but everyone spoke in whispers. His daughter and Zima had broken her 28-day visit to the, of, to the family of her future husband and returned home when they, sh when they heard that her father had been imprisoned and was going to be hanged. As soon as she got home, she went to Obirka to ask what the men of Umofia were going to do about it. But Obirka had not been home since morning. His wives thought he had gone to a secret meeting, and Zima was satisfied that something was being done. On the meeting after the village, village crier's appeal, the men of Amofia met in the marketplace and decided to collect without delay 250 bags of calories to appease the white man. They did not know that 50 bags would go to the court messengers, who had increased the fine for that purpose.